So we continue with our program with Professor Mike Klausner from Stanford Law School. Please. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that some of you are tired of hearing about corporate law because I'm not going to be talking about corporate law. I'm, I'm told that this, this uh, panel is about corporate transactions. I'm going to be talking about transactions, period, whether they're corporate transactions or non-corporate transactions. Um, this is a little synopsis of a book that I'm writing, which stems from a course that I've been teaching for close to 20 years and that Ron Gilson has taught for close to a little bit more than 20 years. He started it and I picked it up, uh, first teaching with Ron uh, a couple years after he started. The course and the book are called Deals, the Economic Structure of Business Transactions. So the goal of the book, and um, I'm addressing this to both practitioners and to people who teach corporate law and people who, students who study corporate law as well. Um, the idea is to bridge the abstract economic theory of contracts, which as some of you may know, some of you may not know, is a very theoretical, mathematical um, literature in economics. And I want to bridge that with actual deals. And by actual deals, I mean deals that have stacks of documents this, this high. And um, uh, integrate them in a way so that the complexity is made clear by virtue of the, the simplicity of the, the underlying economics. Uh, so the objective is to identify the structure within the complexity. That's the goal. So there's a framework, very simple framework. And it says that deals have to address the following uh, elements and only the following elements, thus the simplicity. They have to answer, what am I buying? How am I going to make sure I get it? And what am I going to do, or what are we going to do, if circumstances change? So all deal terms, a stack of documents this high, will address just those things. So what am I buying? Let's refine that a little bit more. What is the asset that is being exchanged or the service that's being exchanged? What is it worth? What is its value? I only want to pay what it's something equal to its value. Therefore, I need to know what its value is. And that's not necessarily easy. That value is often uncertain. Uh, these uncertainty between the buyer and the seller could be symmetrical. You may know, and I, you may not know, and I may not know what it's worth, but I'm still not going to pay more than I think the expected value of the asset is worth, or the expected value of the service is worth. Um, also, if you are the seller and I am the buyer, you may know more than I do. Well, if that's true, we have a problem, because I'm not going to want to pay what you want to sell it for. So what we need to do, and this is a problem that both of us have, you're the seller in these examples and I'm the buyer, is we need to find a way for me to learn more about the value of the asset. That information will often come from you. So for instance, representations and warranties. You're telling me, you're warranting me uh, with some cost to you what something is worth. Um, and then there's going to be the unknown and we have to allocate that unknown, the cost of what is unknown. This is not easy. This is actually very difficult. If we don't solve the problem, we may not have a transaction, even though that transaction, if we knew everything, is in your interest and my interest. So we've got to solve those two problems in this first element. What am I buying? You've got to, you as a seller have a strong interest in convincing me that the price you want is, uh, is that you are selling me something that is worth the price that you're asking. Now, to complicate matters further, the desire of me to learn more from you, and as an aside, let me just say there are other ways I can learn the value of the asset. I can do it myself. I can do my own due diligence. I can find accountants. I can find engineers. I can find other third parties that can inform me about the value of the asset, but I'm going to leave that aside because I've only been given 20 minutes here. Um, if I'm going to get that information from you, there's a conflict that we have to do two things at once. You have to convince me or, or warrant to me what something is worth, and we have to allocate the cost of the unknown. How do th that conflict is reflected in the difficult uh, negotiations that occur over representations and warranties. Think about this. I'm a buyer, you're a seller. 
a normal sale, in a normal sales context, you will try to convince me and you will, try, you will warrant me, and if it's a product, you'll often write me a legally binding warranty of certain, um, you know, the workability of the asset. So I'm asking you, do that for me. And you might say, no, I can't do that for you. I can't do that entirely for you. Why? Because you're not entirely sure. And to the extent you're not 100% sure of the value of, of a certain quality of the assets, for instance, that there, if it's a sale of a business, that there has been no ch um, material change in its um, financial condition or operations since the last financial statements, if you're not 100% sure, uh, and you're going to warrant that to me, you're taking risk on yourself. That's a cost to you. You're giving me, you're incurring a cost potentially for my benefit if you are less than 100% sure. And I, as a buyer, don't know whether you're 100, whether that, where you are 100% sure and where you're not. And to simplify the story a little bit further, uh, uh, I'm going to be suspicious if you won't warrant it because I think you should be 100% sure. So, Given the time, I'm not going to go through a full example, but I could go through an example where I could convince you that the fact that I don't know what you know makes it very difficult for you to give me the sorts of warranties that I want. I'm going to move on, but just leave it with this, this statement that figuring out what I'm buying is less than easy, and there's a chance that we won't get a sale, even though in some ideal sense, if we knew everything, there should be a sale. So move on to the next factor. I would need, want to ensure that I'm getting what I expect. And here we're talking about what's going to happen during the, during the performance period. So the performance of the deal includes a few things. There's the execution of the exchange, whatever we're trading. Uh, that could be something very simple, like a single asset, or it could be a service that extends over a period of time. It could be the construction of an asset that will take a long time. Uh, it could be any range of, uh, of things. So we want to Take care of that, and if it is a long-term contract, we want to make sure that, that ongoing value is being created over a long term. So, you know, imagine a joint venture between two companies. Imagine uh, a project finance uh, transaction. It's going to go on for a number of years. Um, we've got to make sure, each of us has to make sure that we are producing value over those years. That's what we're exchanging. That's what we want to make sure we get. Um, they're also facilitating tasks, like I might want to sh make sure that you get regulatory approval or third party approval for whatever is going to happen, <clears throat> excuse me, after we sign the deal. So this performance involves a number of tasks that have to be performed. So a simple approach would be simply to specify those. Specify them and if you don't do it, enforce it legally. Uh, that's easy enough, that's the easy version. But can I often, how often can I fully specify and enforce the tasks that have to be performed? The answer is not always. Sometimes, sure, yes, and that's an easy contract. But often the answer is no. The reason is that performance may not always be fully observable. And even if it's observable by me, say, your performance is observable by me, I may not be able to convince a court that you have failed to to um, perform up to the level that I've specified in my contract. Your performance may be un unobservable, or even if observable, unverifiable by a court, in which case I can't simply specify and enforce. So things like, are you working hard, if it's a, an employment contract, <clears throat> or if it's a contract that, imply, that involves work? Are you extracting value for yourself? I may not be able to tell. Uh, or if I can tell, I may not be able to prove it to a court. Have you performed faithfully with respect to the details that I've specified? Again, it may not be fully observable, and it may not be fully uh, verifiable to a court. So this is difficult. So when we're, when we're trying to explain the large stack of documents, what those documents are doing is, one, <clears throat> they are doing the first thing, which is convincing me that I'm going to get the value that, uh, that I, um, it's going to prove to me it's the value. And second, you're going to convince me that when we start performing, I will actually get that value. Second, third uh, factor is adjustment to change. This is the most important in a long-term contract, but even an emergent contract, which is fairly short. We have uh, provisions that will respond to change that may occur between the signing and a closing of a deal. Um, 
let's think more about a long-term contract, changes in the economy. You and I have a price that's going to be specified over a 20-year period, say, for the purchase of um, you know, some supply contract. We're going to have to adjust that price for at least for inflation and perhaps for something more specific to the price at which our product is going to be trading. There may be other changes in the product market. Uh, quantity demanded, demanded may change, cost may change. We're going to have to specify uh, how, those, how we will adjust those changes to those changes in the marketplace. And there may be regulatory changes. So our large stock, of stock stack of documents is going to have to respond to those factors as well. It's not necessarily going to be easy. So where have we gotten? So we have a large stack of documents with complex language that's very difficult to understand, but they're all, it all amounts to three things. What am I buying? The stack is going to convince me that what I'm buying is of the value you, the seller, are asking. It's going to work. It's going to address factors during the performance period to make sure that I get what I'm buying. Uh, it may be simply specify it. Um, but there's a good chance that with respect to some factors, it can't specify it. It can't specify it clearly enough uh, to simply allow me to enforce the contract according to its, its terms. Uh, and third, it's going to respond to adjustments in outside circumstances. So that's the framework. I've simplified it a little bit because I've got 20 minutes. And actually, how much time do I have at this point? Who's the timekeeper here? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. OK. Um, I'm going to stop in nine minutes whether I finish or not, I promise you. Um, so I'm going to apply this framework to a single transaction that might illustrate at least a small portion of what will be a much longer book. So here's the setting. Um, the setting is partners in a private corporation. If one exits the corporation, if you and I, you're one person now, I'm one person, if one of us leaves, it might impose costs on the other. We each have particular skills. We work together well. Um, if one of us leaves, we may impose losses on the other. But exit might be jointly maximizing, value maximizing. It might be important that one of us has the opportunity to leave. It might have the, be important that two of us have the opportunity to leave. We just want to do it or assure each other that we won't impose costs on the other when we do exit. So our objective is to allow exit only if it maximizes joint value. Once we maximize joint value, we can worry about how to allocate that joint value. Oops, did I do something wrong? No. Um, here's some complications. We can't specify you will only exit if doing so doesn't impose costs on me, or you will only exit if it maximizes joint value or I will only exit if it maximizes joint value. We don't know how to write those conditions down. The even if we could, the cost of exit is probably unobservable, or at least not fully observable. And if it's observable, it's not going to be verifiable to a court. We can't write down all the scenarios in which you can exit, in which I can exit, uh, with any reliability. It just won't work. In addition, circumstance is going to change. So even if we, even if we wrote this down for a exit in the short term. Uh, if we're entering into a business together, this is probably not a short term uh, engagement. It's a long term engagement. And the circumstances of exit will change. So we can't write it down. Therefore, we've got to find a mechanism by which to do it indirectly. So this is a situation where our number two and number three elements of the framework are problematic. Um, number two, I want to make sure after we start performing, that I get my value and that you don't impose costs on me by leaving me. And two, circumstances are going to change and we have to figure out a way to address that. So that's the setting. I'm going to describe a particular contract. This is an actual contract, Getty Images Inc. It's the company that if you look, at least in the US, and I think it's international, at the little credit underneath photographs in newspapers, it says Getty Images. This is the company. They, wrote, they produced photos for newspapers and the web. Um, they were initially publicly listed, but they had trouble transitioning to electronic media. And as a result, they went through an LBO by Hellman and Friedman, a major private equity firm in the US. We're going to talk about the terms of that LBO, specifically the term regarding exit. 
So here's the transaction. Hellman and Friedman were going to buy 72%, leaving the Getty family. And the Getty is a family. That's important. Uh, it's an old oil family. And you'll see why that's important in a moment. They're going to have 28% after the LBO. So what is each party interested in? The Getty family has a long-term interest in staying with this company. It's got their name. They someday would like to buy the rest of it, perhaps. But in any case, they want to stay involved. And Hellman and Friedman are going to keep the Getty family as CEO and chairman. Um, they can't buy the whole company today. That's an assumption of the, of the LBO. And they're concerned about their family name. They're, they want to make sure that whatever's done with the Getty images, that it doesn't start publishing images that would soil the family name. And you can imagine on the web what kind of images those might be. Um, Hellman and Friedman, they're a private equity firm. They, like Getty, want to maximize value. But they're going to exit. They have to exit. That's what private equity firms do. So hence, this is an example of the exit problem. So they're in, the party's interests are aligned except with respect to exit. Again, if we could specify the contract, specify the terms of exit, we would have no problem. But we can't do that, hence we get into a more complicated mechanism that has to, has to substitute for a specification. So what are the concerns? Who is, uh, with respect to exit, who will Hellman and Friedman sell to? Will they sell to somebody else that would tarnish the family name by publishing images that they don't want on the web? Will the sale reduce value? Is Hellman and Friedman going to find themselves having to exit at a time when the market is low and um, uh, the Getty family won't get full value for their, their interests? And again, will the family name be, be, uh, be harmed? Hellman and Friedman, what do they care about? They need to exit. Their business model involves exit. They can't let the Getty family get in their way. Now, again, we can't specify the terms of exit. Uh, we, can't, we can write all we want. We can write as many pages as we want, but we're not going to succeed in specifying, so we're going to find another way to do it. There's some general approaches to exit. Rights of first refusal, buy-sell agreements. I set a price. You can either buy or sell at that price. You set a price. I can either buy or sell at that price. Uh, also called a put call. And then there are tag-along and drag-along rights that I'm going to explain in a moment. Those are the ones that were used here. If I had a little bit more time, and I think I'm probably down to three and a half minutes, I would explain why those don't fit here. So we're going to only, but we're going to only focus now on tag-along and drag-along rights. How does a tag-along right work? One party, in this case is going to be Hellman and Friedman, wants to sell. And the other party has a choice. They can join in the sale, or they can hold and become a, share, a co-shareholder with the new buyer. They can buy or they can sell or they can hold. This, will, this sale will impose no cost on Getty, at least in general, because they have a choice. They're not forced to sell and they can, they can hold on to the, the company. Now, I'm saying this in general for a particular reason. Um, if I have time, I'll say why this deal was a little bit different. Uh, drag along rights. Drag along rights says that one party can sell, again, Hellman and Friedman, and force the other to sell, meaning Getty can't say, hey, I am not going to sell unless you pay me extra. They can't hold up uh, Hellman and Friedman. The drag-along rights prevent that. So once again, these two rights together, th this right, would tend toward uh, promoting a sale at fair value. So be together, these rights should promote a coordinated sale at the best price, because one party is going to choose to sell. Presumably, it will want to ma maximize the price at which it sells. And the other party, if it agrees, can sell to, maximizing joint welfare. Or if it thinks it can do better by holding, it can hold. Again, maximizing joint welfare. And neither party can hold up the other by refu In this case, it's really, it's just uh, the Getty family cannot hold up, cannot extract extra value from Hellman and Friedman by refusing to go along when Hellman and Friedman has to sell. So this is a very, tag-along and drag-along rights are mechanisms that are very clever in indirectly achieving what full specification would achieve where full specification of exit scenarios is impossible. So I could end it right there, uh, but then there would be no point in talking about Hellman and Friedman specifically. Hellman and Friedman had, and, and Getty had a specific uh, problem. They had potentially divergent interests in selling. Hellman and Friedman had a time frame. They had to sell within, say, six, seven years when they had to uh, liquidate their fund uh, their, uh, and, and pay proceeds to their investors. And Getty had a particular problem with the family name. They didn't want to sell to anybody 
Because what if anybody decided that the best way to maximize value of this company was to produce images, and this could well be the case, on the web that would tarnish the family name. There are certain images, again, and you can imagine what they are, that the Getty family didn't want associated with their name. These two, this divergence in interest could produce a problem. So, I have one minute left, I'm guessing. How did they address it? The Hellman and Friedman problem, the, 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 po the possibility that they would have to sell soon, they actually did not respond to. Uh, there was not, they, they, there was not going to be a contractual response to that. Hellman and Friedman, however, is a repeat player in the private equity market, and if they got a, developed a reputation for selling too quickly or selling too low because they had to get out, that wouldn't help their long-term business. So apparently the Getty family was happy to trust that Hellman and Friedman would do their best to maximize value, despite the fact that they might be constrained by selling sooner than what would be ideal. So we have no, no solution to that problem, but perhaps it wasn't that serious given reputational interest. Now to protect the, the Getty family name, we do have a provision, and it said that the Getty family could withhold the name upon sale. So if there were a sale to a third party, call it Third Party Inc., um, Getty could say, you're not going to call this company Getty Images anymore. You're going to call it Third Party Inc. Images, uh, and we're simply not selling our name to you. Now, that would reduce the value of the, of the company, because Getty Images has some uh, uh, you know, strong presence in the market. I'm down to zero, so I'm going to stop right now. Um, in short, Getty Images would bear some cost of doing that because they're a 28% 20, shareholder. Uh, they still could do it. So this is a slight imperfection in the system. They probably are not taking a lot of value out by uh, imposing this restriction, but there would be, again, some value uh, uh, taken out of the deal as a result of the family being able to take their name but presumably, by preserving their name, they're improving their own welfare to a greater extent, and the likelihood they're imposing costs on Hellman and Friedman is not that high, that, that much, that much, that likely or that high. So again, finally, this is a perfect but not, this is an imperfect but not too bad solution to the problem of how to specify uh, performance during the performance period where specification is not possible, but, um, and, and how to address changing circumstances where that too can't be addressed through specification. I'm done.